thanks for coming. Uh, I rarely speak, so this is a rare opportunity for me to talk. Um, let me first start by introducing myself. Um, my name is David, so I'm a CEO of Gumi Asia. We're based, um, we are a company actually headquartered in uh, Japan. But um, two years ago, I set up the office here in Singapore, and from there, we've uh, expanded across the region um, to Indonesia, to Philippines, to Taiwan, and we've also set up uh, Korea, China, and recently Paris. Um, so I come from a very vast background in IT, fast-moving consumer goods. Before I joined Gumi, actually, uh, I came from uh, Electronic Arts, uh, EA, and before that was IH Games. And just before Gumi, I was actually running a gaming business, real gambling casinos. I was running casinos in uh, Vietnam, in Malaysia, in Philippines. Um, so it's similar and yet very different. Uh, you deal with real, uh, real money. So I'm a father of four boys, very proud of them. They're aged from 10 to 19. Um, avid gamer. Um, philosophy in life is love what you do and do what you love. So I'm loving it at the moment. So this is a snapshot of Gumi. I'll just run into a very quick uh, intro of what Gumi is all about. When I joined Gumi two years ago, we were 250 people. Um, at the time, we had just uh, won the technology Fast 50 as the fastest growing company in Japan. Uh, we went through a tough patch last year, but then now we are back and up again. Um, we have 680 employees uh, worldwide at the moment and uh, still growing fast. So this is the different uh, mobile game business segments that uh, Gumi handles. We are primarily a developer. And in the early days of uh, Gumi, we were very web-centric, very browser-based HTML5. Uh, mainly on the GUI platform, Mubage platform. And last year, we made a really painful transition into native gaming. It was really difficult because the whole company was centered around web-based gaming. And um, huge plunge in revenues on the web uh, side. The market actually very surprisingly shifted so rapidly that most companies were caught with their pants down. Right? Good thing that we came out of that and we made the right moves uh, Last year, um, actually, Gumi Asia was set up <coughs> primarily to develop that and to build a publishing platform uh, that would span across the world. Um, we do also license IP, so we had the privilege of uh, building a browser-based game with uh, EA, Playfish, uh, FIFA, that went to the top of the Japan chart uh, two years ago, and we were number one, number two on the GUI platform, and that was a huge success for us as well as other titles like Monster Hunter, um, among others, right? So on the publishing, it's um, a new venture. In building uh, our titles, we thought that we would need to have very um, a strong publishing arm in order for us to grow and scale rapidly. Um, so in the last couple of years, we have spent a lot of effort into building up um, state-of-the-art publishing platform. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about it uh, later on. Most of the titles we publish are first party, which is in-house developed. Recently, we also did uh, some second party titles where we invested in companies. One of the examples is a company in Hong Kong called Epic Force. We took a game that they had already uh, published before. Um, we localized, customized, made some changes, and plugged it into Kutau Top. And that shot to the top of the charts in Korea, and we managed to make some money out of that. And recently, we went into um, third-party publishing as well, um, taking on, you're going to hear about some of the new IPs that we're signing on uh, this year and next year. So that's another new exciting direction that we are going into. So this is some of our product portfolio. 2011 and 2012 was primarily web-based uh, titles. 2013, um, we started putting a lot more native titles, and 2014, 2015, we have 30 plus titles currently in development and getting ready to launch. So, 
we have a lot of IP collaboration ongoing. Some I can't tell you about at the moment. Um, but we have um, uh, gotten the FIFA IP again uh, this year. So just in time for the World Cup. So we have three soccer games coming up soon. Um, we also collaborated with a company called Ankama in France to build a game called Waxfu. Um, this is a transmedia project because uh, they're already on TV series, animated series, and MMORPG. So we are porting uh, the game now into mobile to serve maybe their existing 10, 20 million customers that they have. So this is um, a direction that we are thinking uh, would be good and set for the future. So um, my presentation, a lot of it would be based on data from Brave Frontier. So some of you may have heard of this game. Uh, we published it in Japan uh, slightly less than a year ago. And five months ago, uh, I took the game, localized it into 12 languages, um, and then launched it um, into Southeast Asia, US, UK, Australia, all the English-speaking world. And currently released in 19 countries. Um, just last week, we released the whole of Europe as well. And also, uh, China has just come in. So now we are a truly global game. We have achieved top 10. Um, in fact, I think in the US, we are number six. And uh, Southeast Asia, I believe we are top five in every country on both platforms. These are some of the results uh, on top grossing charts for the game. You can see all that in MN anyway. So down to the presentation proper. Um, what do I mean by this demystifying Southeast Asia? Um, when, well, Southeast Asia's market is comprised of 11 countries with 628 million uh, population. And roughly last year, there was about 190 million uh, people on the internet, right? Um, it's projected that this market, especially in the big six, is going to grow to 205 million within the next two years or less, one and a half years. Um, the big growth you can see, um, especially in Indonesia, everybody's been talking about Indonesia recently because of the, the boom uh, that's occurring there. A uh, huge population, 250 million, still relatively low smartphone penetration, relatively low internet penetration. But the growth you see is phenomenal. From 36 million now, it's projected to hit 80 million within the next one and a half years. This is another alarming uh, slide that I found. Um, it's about mobile internet ad spending in the world. So two years ago, it was 8.7 billion. But if you look at the projection, this is crazy. 94 billion to be spent on mobile ad spending. How do you justify something like that, right? With all that spending, there has to be some massive, massive increase in revenues in order to justify or to drive this uh, traffic. I mean, if the slide is correct, right? How much of that spend is actually positive ROAS, return on ad spend? How many companies? I, I heard some stats uh, two days ago. I can't name the source, but um, the person told me that um, maybe only the top 100 or top 150 game companies are actually making money. The rest of them are just either breaking even or losing money in a very big way. So although we're in a very uh, exciting industry, it's also full of uh, pitfalls and a lot of risks, right? You spend a year building a game, you spend millions of dollars building a game, and then you find that you don't have enough money to get, out, to get the game out there in the market or get enough users uh, around it. So uh, in my presentation, I try to um, show you some of what we did in Southeast Asia for us to rank up in the charts, right? Gumi is trying to make um, global gaming pub publishing and user acquisition into a science. It's not an art, right? So when I thought about this topic and wanted to find a picture that would capture the essence of what it means, right? What is the Southeast Asian uh, market? So I, I did what everybody else would do to go to Google and search Southeast Asia mobile market. And then up pops this picture. I think Go Google is um, seldom wrong. The, they featured smart, uh, they, they were smart enough to feature Brave Frontier. And because of that, uh, our Android revenues are higher than iOS revenues. 
So I like to think that maybe this is the snapshot of what people think Southeast Asian market is at this moment, but I think it's not. So this is what uh, my presentation is about. Many people think of uh, Southeast Asia as a tier three market. If a tier three market even exists, what does it mean tier three market, right? It's usually an afterthought. So they always go for the largest market. They go to Japan, they go to China, they go to US, and then everybody wants to go into Canada and Australia to launch. And because of that, you see record uh, CPIs, 10 bucks, 15 bucks. Only the rich can go there and acquire traffic to test out their game. So the market has shifted uh, tremendously. Uh, this is a slide I'm quite proud of because being from Singapore, um, we managed to sustain number one grossing in Singapore for the last three months, um, which was really exciting and uh, top, four, uh, top five in the region. So it seems the market is not bad over here, right? It's not what a lot of people think. Um, some of the things that we managed to achieve in the last four months, 450,000 Facebook fans on the English version in four months, two and a half million downloads in Southeast Asia, and very surprisingly, four months average ARPPU, uh, 2175. So we're not talking about a record uh, ARPPU, we're talking an average ARPPU. Record ARPPU in Thailand, we saw $43.57. And across uh, Indonesia, Vietnam, we were seeing between 16 to $20 on ARPPU, which are crazy numbers because that's higher than the US. The average uh, US ARPP numbers are about 16 bucks, right? Why is this so? So when I was in the casino industry, we always talk about the whales, right? Uh, one single whale would, uh, or all the whales on the VIP, section actually account for 80% of all the revenue in the casinos that I ran. So it's very important for you to understand how do you market to the whales, how do you acquire them, how you retain them, how do you uh, sell to them, keep them happy, and how you manage them. Well, in gaming, when you look at Southeast Asia, most people know that um, Google Store, Android, uh, Android Store, and iOS, 95% of most of the people in Southeast Asia do not have a credit card, right? But if you do have a credit card, it means that you're already quite well off. And if you're selling to those people who are well off, they have a higher propensity to pay. And that's why you have this phenomenon that few actually understand or few actually know, right? So this is the market overview. On the top left-hand side, the exciting key point there is that if you look at the European market, the market value is 21 billion, right? But the CAGR is 3%. If you look at the US market, it's 20 billion, but the CAGR is 1%, compounded annual growth rate. But if you look at the Asia Pacific market, although it's currently at 19 billion, the annual growth rate is 13%. So that's very, very exciting, right? Coupled with the growth of the market, there's also the growth on spending, right? Southeast Asia is also the second largest mobile ma uh, market for mobile ad impressions. Uh, besides the US, Southeast Asia is ranked number two, right? Naturally, in the States, they are the ones that started it all, and they have the biggest amount of mobile ad impressions. But I mean, the, the, the growth in Asia, the growth in Southeast Asia is just so alarming, right? What does this all mean to us? I'll explain to you later slide. Also that Southeast Asia, um, people spend a higher average number of hours on the mobile phone. So it gives us a larger opportunity to market to this average of three hours, right? Smartphone penetration rate, if you look at Indonesia, it's currently at 23% and a population of 250 million people. Think about the potential and growth. In Singapore, it's 87%, right? So most Singaporeans already have a smartphone. Those that don't have a smartphone are either the older people that don't know how to operate a smartphone, or the army boys that are not allowed to have camera phones or smartphones in there uh, when they go to camp. Those Singaporeans will know what I mean. Um, but, so the potential is huge. Potential is uh, very great. So can anyone guess what is Kakao Talks, uh, second largest market out of um, Korea? They're number one in Korea, they dominate like 75% of all the messaging 
uh, market in Korea. But what's the second largest market? Anybody know? Indonesia is right. So most people would say Japan. And if you said Japan, you would be right last year. But recently they announced that Indonesia exploded within one year. And now there's 13 million, 13 million subscribers on Kakao Talk. Okay, so this is an important slide. So we have uh, established that Southeast Asia is a market of whales. And we have established that Southeast Asia has high growth rates. So how do we capitalize on this? So to get a greater chance of hyper ROI, return on investment, right? It's an equation, a mixture between acquisition cost, revenue per acquisition, how much money you get from each one of the install. Because um, I always hear people talk about CPI, right? You talk to developers or you talk to some agencies, they come to you, I can get you the cheapest CPI in the market. I'm the cheapest person in the market. So I can't understand that. To me, it's really confusing because if I build a good product, why would I show the product in the cheapest market? Why would I go show it to people that we know they are not monetizing on other games? Why would I want to show it to people who um, not buying, not paying? Because we are, playing, uh, we are selling a free-to-play game, right? It's free-to-play. Expectations are very high. You built a great product, you invested a huge amount of resources, and then you go out there and you look for the cheapest buy. So I don't do that. I do that for a different reason. It's a combination, which I'll explain to you in a short while, um, of different factors that will contribute to success of uh, how you do acquisition. I think there was a question earlier on how you get your apps uh, discovered in the market or how you get new users. Number two is revenue per acquisition. Number three is organic and referral. And I'll drill down into each one of these um, points in a while. So greater chance of hyper ROI if acquisition cost is low, ARPPU is high, and organic and referral opportunities are high. So the first part, rule number one, know your LTV. So don't win clicks, win customers. Clicks are no use to you. Downloads and installs at the start is important. And I have a good slide to show you why it's important at the start. Bid for high value visibility, don't bid for traffic, right? The opportunity in Southeast Asia is big because it's a very fragmented ecosystem at the moment. If you go to the US, most of the ad traffic or impressions are controlled by some of the largest uh, ad networks out there. And um, it's very saturated and it's very uh, easy to navigate there. But when you come to Southeast Asia, I mean, Pepe can tell you that, right? You come to Southeast Asia, some agencies are strong, some networks are strong in some countries, they are not strong in other countries, right? They can only deliver you some small traffic here, but bigger traffic there. Um, and a lot of them can't really track the traffic very well or understand uh, who the audience is, right? There's a huge demand supply gap uh, because everybody is actually, so this is the secret at the moment. People don't realize how good a market it is, so they're not staying away and they're not willing to buy the traffic from here. So they stay away, right? And because of that, inventory is very high, impressions are very high, cost is very, very low. So it's the best time for you to come in and take the traffic and acquire as much traffic as possible. Level of maturity, there's a lack of targeting data for meaningful optimization. Whoever can solve that is going to make tons of money. Rule number two. Revenue per acquisition, you can't fix what you can't measure. So if you don't understand your customers, your audience, um, you won't be able to know what is right or what, is, what needs to be fixed. So install is not your end goal, right? Install is not your end goal. Some people say, oh, I'm, I paid this amount of CPI, I wanna get uh, 50,000 installs a day in this particular market, but they see, hey, why am I not making money? Why is it that I'm not getting my return? And they have no clue why. So you must be able to track, you must be able to understand um, what you need to track, right? So post-install tracking and attribution is really important. Um, what kind of customers uh, are you targeting? So from the initial part when you're acquiring a huge uh, number of campaigns, you're running a huge number of campaigns, you're getting a lot of users coming in, and then you're studying the audience and you're seeing, okay, this group of people, let me go back one slide. Okay, if you look at this, I don't think you can see it. There's four quadrants up there. 
the left side is revenue per install, the right side x axis is cost per acquisition. How much it costs you, how much it costs you to acquire the user versus how much the revenue the user is coming, uh, is giving to you. And you see all the blue dots? The blue dot is every single campaign that you run. So I'm running this campaign, I'm targeting age 18 to 24 um, of this demographic, of this geographic area, and bringing in from this agency. So we work with 50 agencies just to target the Southeast Asian market. And we uh, optimize hourly. We track the health of each campaign and we plot it. So most uh, developers have, and maybe Kabam probably has that, a huge team, uh, army of uh, data scientists, right, crunching numbers on spreadsheets and looking at the spreadsheets and say, which one is giving me the best uh, return, right? If you look at all the blue dots, you want to have all the traffic that's on the left and on the top, the top left-hand quadrant, because those are the ones that give you the highest revenue per install at the lowest cost per install. So once you find that, this campaign runs, then you want to say, okay, how do I find people who are similar to this person? Where did this guy come from? Where did he come in and click through and install? How much did he spend? When was his first deposit? When was his second deposit? How much RPI am I getting from him? Who are his friends? What does he like? What game does he not like? Um, I hope you're getting me. So this is the secret part of the <laughs> whole presentation, right? I hope you get what I'm saying. So if you can find that, you go for a look-alike campaign, you go out there and you target um, people who are similar. And because of that, I've seen $10 RPI on a 99 cent acquisition. You pay 99 cents, you get an install, and you get 10 bucks. So I've seen uh, some very high quality traffic that we have gotten uh, a one month revenue of $6,000 from 50 players in Singapore. So, amazing. Rule number three, invite and broadcast. So once you've brought in the users, right? So outbound acquisition, inbound referrals. Outbound uh, requisition, acquisition refers to you going out there and paying for ads. Uh, buying ads, buying media, um, talking to bloggers to write about your um, game, how great it is, talking to celebrities and saying that, hey, you know, I want you to tweet four times a month and tell your one million followers that you play this game and it's the greatest game in the world, right? A lot of different strategies people will use and try to bring in traffic. But once you get those, I think um, the, the most powerful strategy beyond that is referrals, word of mouth. Building mechanics into your game that will allow this. So if you go play Brave Frontier, those who don't have it yet, please go download it. Um, if you go play, uh, play Brave Frontier, you'll see a lot of mechanics inside that would drive people to share, to boast, to um, when you finish a battle and hey, you know, you beat your, your enemy and you want to boast it to the world and then you share it with your 1,000 Facebook friends, right? And there in the link, you can just click and download. Those are mechanics that uh, improve your referral and increase your uh, acquisition. And those are free. So hyper grow your social media fan base. Go to our Facebook, take a look at what we have done, what are activities uh, that we have conducted, and how we actually grow our fan base. How do we go about paid media? So this is the other very important slide. It's a bit confusing. Uh, it's a very long tail model. Um, first, you hit the low-hanging fruit. Then you collect sizable uh, audience data. And then you create high LTV buckets. So I have another chart, which I didn't show here. Four quadrants. Y-axis is how much play time the person spends in the game. X-axis is how much money they spend in the game. So the bottom left-hand corner is the window shoppers. Right, these are the people who come in, they download, and they say, ha, I like the game, I may not like the game. The people on the right of that are the early adopters. They come in, they pay immediately. So these are the ones you want to take attention, uh, pay attention to, because they pay at the early stage, they pay on day one. I have about, at the start when we first launched the game, we had a 30% pay, 
pay rate from day one install, which was an amazing number. Right? Top left-hand corner are those people that spend tons of time in the game, but they don't spend at all. So they would, they would be level 100 before they first uh, put in the first dollar into the game. But then the top right-hand corner are all my dolphins and my whales. So you must have a system that knows and identifies and puts all these people into buckets. And once you know who they are, you know how to target them, retarget them, convert them, run customized campaigns in order to monetize them, retain them, and make sure, most importantly, that they have a good time in the game. So they're going to stay, they're going to bring their friends. Right? So at the start of each campaign, um, it's all about discoverability. It's all about, hey, now I've built this fantastic game, how do I get a million people uh, to know about it? So of course, the best option is getting Apple or Google to feature you, right? That's the best option. But how many people get featured? Well, not many people get featured. So then you have to think about the second route. Find someone to go publish it that has millions of users that can cross-promote into my game. But there are not many developers out there that would have such connections or possibilities unless you build the next uh, Clash of Clans, right? So how do you go about it? You need to have, first of all, a high volume acquisition uh, campaign, it is necessary. So don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying don't go do your boost campaigns or incentivize campaigns. You must have that because it's only during that time that you can get the data and the audience data so that you can understand. Because uh, if you pass that window, you'll never be able to go bucket uh, the users and actually see uh, who are the important people that you want to target and get your high LTV uh, users. Okay, so summary, Southeast Asia is the profitable market for the better prepared. So how do you prepare? Right? Low acquisition cost, there's a high inventory supply, uh, there's unique traditional media. You go to Indonesia, you can tie up with some payment providers that will provide you 9,000 outlet uh, traditional TV screens to screen your video. They can come in, cyber cafes everywhere, 6,000 cyber cafes, 10,000 cyber cafes. Those are traditional media that's not available. Uh, in most of the West. High ARPPU customers, um, low acquisition rate, high paying rate, um, high referral traffic because um, Asians actually are very sociable. They have 80% more friends compared to the global average. So there's a huge social market. Get them to bring their friends, right? This slide actually shows um, that it's important to balance both uh, operations, nurture your users, run events, we have daily events, we have weekly events, we have monthly events, we have all sorts of events, right? Customer service is really important. Um, on some months, we handle about 140,000 tickets in one month, which is averaging three to 4,000 tickets a day. We span across three time zones, we run seven by 24. So get your customers, hold on to your customers, understand your customers. So how do we reduce uh, successful mobile game publishing from an art to a science? So art is not repeatable, right? But science is absolute. Science, you can scale. Science, you can understand. Science, you can repeat. So that's really important. But there's no secret sauce. There are only secret sauces. Combination of operations, uh, with distribution, with user acquisition, with automation. So we have a lot of systems that we've built over the last couple of years that can bucket the users and then automatically target uh, them through trigger events. If this user comes in and he hasn't spent within three days, send an offer he cannot refuse. Make him spend. If he doesn't spend again, two days later, send something out to him. If this user spends the first time and hasn't spent for another three days to buy the second item, send him an offer and uh, for one hour. Make it limited, right? Rich insights, you must have really good analytics to understand your customers. And my final slide is talking about combining the best of both worlds. So I think the Eastern uh, developers actually sort of invented uh, gacha and monetization methods, uh, free, to free to play game design, uh, content cycle. Um, players in the East love to grind. Players in the West don't like that. So you need to culturalize, localize, make changes in the game to suit the different markets. You see that our global version is very different from the Japanese version um, in some ways, and we have uh, very specialized content as, as well. At the same time, we learned a lot from Western uh, developers. 
in terms of the UX design, how to engage the users, how to increase stickiness in the game, um, and how to use data-powered advertising to improve uh, our acquisition, to improve our retention. So in ending, uh, come talk to us. <laughs> if you want some advice or help, um, we don't claim to be the best, but uh, we are a good partner. Thank you very much.